I'd like to welcome each one of you to our, to our devotional study today. I invite you to take your Bible, come with me if you would, to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, we are in the middle part of this chapter, and we see here that as Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross of Calvary, he's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as we look at these verses ahead of us, we see that Jesus has a warning and some counsel for his disciples. And uh, indeed, as we look into these things, there are several things that we can learn as well as the people of God. And we also can take warning and we can also follow some of the counsel that Jesus has given his disciples here in this passage. So let's just begin to read in Luke chapter 22 and in verse 21. It says, But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it is determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them which of them should be counted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as a younger and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel." So there's a couple of things that are noticed as we move through these pa uh, through this passage. First of all, I want you to see the betrayer denounced in verses 21 through 23. And as we come into these verses, we see here the fact that our God is omniscient, that he knows all, and that there's absolutely nothing that is hidden from him. And friends, we would do well to understand and remember that glorious truth. Let me just show you a couple of verses that remind us of that truth, that we cannot hide anything from God. Back in Psalm 139, Psalm 139, it says in verse 1, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down. And are acquainted with all my ways, for there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast set, beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. So as we come into the Psalm 139, David, the author of the psalm, reminds us that God is infinite. He reminds us that God is omniscient. And he tells us that God knows all about us. In verses 1 through 3, we see that God knows what we do. In verse 2, we see that God knows what we think. And in verses 4 through 6, we see that God knows what we say. That he knows all there is to know about us. He not only knows what we do, but he knows why we do what we do. He knows the very motives behind it all. And David concludes by saying... Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. He says, God, the awareness that you have of every situation is mind-boggling. And we see then in verses 7 through 13 of Psalm 139 also that God is omnipresent. There is nowhere that you can go that he is not aware and that he is not there. And as we think about his awareness and the fact that nothing is hidden from him, in Hebrews 4.13, it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He said, listen, it's evident before God all of the things that we do, all the things that we think, and all of the things that we say. And friends, we should, be, we should live with an awareness of that in our lives, that God knows and that we are going to give an account to him. But notice he says here in verse 21, he says, Behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. God knew exactly who Judas Iscariot was. He knew exactly what he was going to do. And notice that he was very good at fooling people, but he did not fool God. Notice in verse 22, it says, Truly the Son of Man goeth 
as it is determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So we see here that, that Jesus pronounces these woes. He denounces the betrayer here. But notice what it says in verse 23. They began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. Peter was such a good imitator, or rather, Judas was such a good imitator. He was such a good professor that when Jesus was sitting there with the 12 apostles at the last Passover, after he had instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, listen, one of you is going to betray me. And, and they did not have any idea who it was at that point. They were like, Lord, who is it? They were very unaware of the fact and they were able to fool, Judas Iscariot was able to fool the other 11 that were sitting at the table that day, but he was not able to fool God. God knew exactly what was going on. He knew exactly what was in Judas's heart and mind, and he reveals it onto the other apostles, exactly what Judas was going to do, even though they did not know who it was that he was talking about. And then Enogus also in verse 24, the disciples begin to, or the apostles rather, begin to have this discussion about the reward in the kingdom. And it says in verse 24, and there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. Did you catch that? And, and we'll look at this strife. It may be tomorrow that we unpack it. But did you catch this? It says that there was a strife among them. Can you imagine this for just a moment? They are just partaking of the last Passover with the Lord Jesus Christ. They are having some very intimate moments with him where he's having some very direct teaching toward them. And he's just get done instituting the Lord's Supper. He has just got done telling them, listen, of the 12 of you, one of you is going to betray me. And they sat there and tried to figure out who it was that was going to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the midst of all that was going on, as Jesus goes toward the cross of Calvary in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says that amongst the disciples that there was a strife among them. You know, it seems incredible that the disciples would resort to foolish strife in this trying hour. Jesus is facing the most difficult moment of his life. And rather than be in the support system for him, and rather than be in the ones who would watch and pray, they got to the place that in a moment of crisis, in a moment that was of utmost importance, that there was a strife amongst the disciples in that trying hour. And it just shows how weak the flesh of man is and that we cannot depend upon the flesh, that we must depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And friend, we need to be very careful because Satan continues to do this today. And what a wonderful and what a powerful lesson it is to us. Whenever God is seeking to do anything great in our midst, you can mark it down that Satan is going to work overtime and that he's going to try to bring in strife, that he's going to try to bring in division. And friends, we must not only be aware of that, but we must be watchful to make sure that we are not the tool that Satan uses to bring strife and division amongst the people of God. Oh, friends, here was a moment when they should have been standing with the Lord Jesus Christ and, and all of that. But in the midst of it all, there was a strife of, amongst the disciples. And really, it was a foolish strife, as we are going to see in our next devotional together, about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Friends, we need to be very careful that we do not get sidetracked by our agenda, that we do not get sidetracked by our feelings, but that we understand that what is, is, is important is the will of God. What is important is God being glorified in our midst, and we don't get caught up in the foolish strife that the disciples get caught up in here. Oh, friends, Satan continues to use that today. Let's not be ignorant of his devices. And let's certainly be very careful that by the help of God, we do not fall prey to this strife trap that Satan uses so often. When he gets even Christians that are controlled by the old nature, by the flesh, rather than controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Let me ask you as we, as we, conclu as we conclude our study today, who, conclude, who controls you? Are you controlled by the Holy Spirit of God or are you controlled by your human spirit? Friends, if you're not controlled by the Holy Spirit, you're walking in sin. 
and it's time to get before God and acknowledge that you need to die to the old man and be alive to the new man in Jesus Christ. Have a great day.